Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us for the West Week panel, Outdoor Dining, the New Cultural Experience. We would like to thank our gracious virtual host, Janice at Sea, the definitive source for site, garden, and casual furnishings. All the very beautiful backgrounds that you're seeing today are completed projects from around the world with stunning Janice products. Before we dive into the world of luxury outdoor dining, we would like to introduce our moderator, the executive editor of Rob Report, Janice O'Leary. Prior to joining the magazine in 2013, Janice has previously written for Harvard Magazine, Body and Soul, the Boston Globe and Boston Common Magazine, among others, and has taught journalism and writing at Harvard and Boston University. At the Rob Report, Janice oversees home design, real estate, wine, and the column section. Thank you so much, Janice, for leading today's panel. Thank you, Christine. It's such a pleasure to be part of this panel for West Week. Um, living in California, it's easy to be passionate about the outdoors um, and especially outdoor dining. Um, and I think each of our panelists here has a particular expertise that they can show to, the, to all of us. Um, Larry, let's begin with you, if you don't mind. Um, Tell us a little bit about your background in fine dining. I think you're currently the um, director of dining at Stone Edge Farm, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. I've been working with uh, Stone Edge Farm Estate Vineyards and Winery for about six years, the past six years. Uh, a really wonderful small winery here in Sonoma. And uh, we're fortunate enough to have owners who are very passionate about both food and wine and recognizing that both of them are complicated complemented more with, you know, the other. Um, we only make about 3,000 cases of wine a year. And instead of having a, a, a tasting room model here in the town of Sonoma, we actually have a restaurant here in the town of Sonoma. So we showcase our wines uh, with either private dinners with our collectors, of which we have about 800, or, or we're also open to the public a few nights a week where we pour our wines alongside our uh, food that is provided here. We have a five acre farm uh, and we have about 20 planted acres of uh, various grapes for the wine. So uh, how, how has Stone Edge's um, you know, dining program changed over the last year? How have they had to pivot? Uh, you know, it's been a real challenge. A lot of it has, uh, you know, there's all those other adjectives too, exciting, challenging, um, but uh, it has, it certainly has been a real challenge. And in the town of Sonoma, like a lot of other places, we were closed and then opened and then closed again. Uh, and so we adapted in a lot of different ways using to-go food, which we did like a lot of other restaurants. And we looked at the to-go's as a way of kind of doing something different as well. Um, certainly keeping with our own background and thought process of, uh, you know, using ingredients, but also using products that, so no plastic or anything else was used. But we decided to keep in our same model of doing like a three course menu. So we were offering to goes, but we were doing that as a three course menu. So you'd have a package of an appetizer course, a package of main courses, and then a package of dessert as well. Um, you know, since that time, we've now reopened on our patio. We are very fortunate to have a lovely little patio. And going back to, you know, the end of last year, we looked at how we could really create a wonderful environment on our patio. And we threw out adjectives like winter wonderland um, and, you know, outside dining in Europe, like to be in Zurich at Christmas time where you know, you might be eating outside, but all these things are offered to you that makes the outdoor dining so beautiful, you know? Um, so pashminas and heaters and warm seats and comforting food. Uh, and so we spent a lot of time figuring out how we wanted our patio to look. And so we're offering these really wonderful lamb's wool seat covers on our patio. We have obviously the more usual kind of propane heaters, uh, but we also have these really wonderful small kind of table heaters as well. So kind of keeping your legs warm. Um, and then we're fortunate enough to have just a cozy environment. Um, and we have a lovely fireplace on our, uh, you know, propane gas burning fireplace. But we have a lovely little fireplace on our patio as well. 
And so we've adapted that. And then also just recognizing that, you know, when people coming out to eat now, it, it almost means more to them. It's not just something that they might just haphazardly do. It's, you have to think about going out to dinner. You have to think about where you're going to go. You want to make sure it has all those right, you know, needs and environments. It's true. It is a much more considered choice now. Yeah. Um, and, you know, accommodating that, thinking about that um, and accommodating, you know, comfort. I love the idea of the lower table um, heating, heating lamps. That sounds very comfortable. I, can I have one at home? <laughs> that was, that sounds great. Um, Kay, I'm wondering, how, you know, what your experience has been. Um, tell us a little bit about your firm. Well, we're located in, uh, and Associates is located in uh, Southern California, and we've done projects all up and down the coast, many uh, famous resorts, uh, and across the country, as well as even um, Dubai. So uh, luckily, we've been pretty busy through this pandemic. Uh, obviously, the business part of it, the new builds have gone down, but we, we were doing a lot of renovation. And you know, speaking to indoor outdoor spaces, uh, several of the spaces, almost mid design, we really had to pivot and try to figure out what to do with the extra space that we might have had outdoors, where the owners would have not necessarily, from a restaurant point of view, wanted their service going back and forth because it's you know it's, it's extra labor. It it takes you have to make sure you have a delivery system so guests don't get you know. Uh, frustrated, you know, if, if it's coming, you know, from a farther place in the kitchen, since we mostly do hotels. Um, so it's been interesting. We, we've designed a lot of new rooftops, very engaging rooftops, and used a lot of Janice's furniture most recently. So it's been wonderful. What do you see as the kind of most important design elements for those outdoor spaces? You know, I, I, I really feel, I, I learned this a while back with one, one of my Korean clients uh, told me because we went to uh, Bellagio and they, I said, why are we going to Bellagio? He said, we're going gambling because they have a rooftop there over their gambling tables. And I said, why? And I, he said, because that brings good look and that, that makes people feel comfortable. And the same thing is really evident outside where you see these pavilions, you see cabanas, you see uh, modular systems with retractable roofs, you see partial enclosures or L-shaped, you know, attachments to the building. Um, I, I just think that if you allow people places to go where they feel like they have a living room environment, a dining environment, a hangout environment, a bar environment, whatever the menu is that drives the services and you give them different places to explore. It's the same process when you're designing interiors, you're just focusing on the exterior. The main challenge again, as I said, is the kitchens are typically inside. Uh, not necessarily the bars, but the kitchens are. So it's just that service pathway is very important. Are you seeing any um, any changes in their in your clients' requests because of COVID um, for outdoor dining? You know, any specific requests? Um, yeah, a lot of meters. Um, it's funny, you know, the crazy things we live in Southern California. And I think our state is the one state that has the least amount of outdoor dining. I mean, New York City has more outdoor dining. I've always thought it was a weird, you know, codes that they have here that prohibits that. And I hope the state of California really looks into that and really promotes this because we do have gorgeous weather and there are so many opportunities for these restaurateurs as well as hotels to take advantage of this outdoor space. But in terms of materials, um, what we're seeing is we're seeing a lot more outdoor living spaces. For example, it's not uncommon to have a feeling of your indoor space completely transitioned to the outdoor where you have living rooms, you have poofs, you have end tables, you have outdoor lamps that look like real lamps. You have heaters that are nicely disguised. Um, you have outdoor lighting and, and, and a lot of these products are coming on the market right now and I hope more come out on the market um, that are really paying attention to the outdoors because, you know, everyone loves to sit outdoors, 
have enough. Right. And you want it to be beautiful. You want it to be as beautiful as the food. And um, comfortable. I think comfort is okay. the <laughs> Right. And, and comfort. Absolutely. Without the comfort, no one wants to linger for the three course meal that Larry was talking about. Um, you know, we want everyone wants to be able to enjoy that meal, stretch it out, have some cocktails or a glass of great wine. Um, Alexis, now you're also in the design space for hospitality and you've worked with many restaurants, bringing the magic of the outdoors inside. Um, tell us a little bit about Preen and um, what you do and how you've seen things change in the last year. Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, so Preen is an architecture and hospitality design firm. We're based in historic core in Chinatown in downtown LA. Uh, we've been deep in the heart of the food world for many, many years. I'm over 20 years now in it. And uh, we also do some hotel nature lodge and we have recently been focusing a lot more on uh, transformative and sacred space. Um, I think with the outdoor dining, you know, obviously when, when COVID happened and, um, and uh, it, the restaurants were shut and there was a dramatic decrease to income, a lot of the work we were doing was working with city officials to really open up, take over streets, open up sidewalks, create a generosity that is the spirit of hospitality and um, share some of these spaces and get that moving. And I, um, one of the fun restaurants we opened right before COVID is called Piccadilly in Culver City. And it, and, uh, it is a bizarre and awesome fusion between low Asian and Southern Eastern seaboard. And we had designed it as a fresh pop apocalyptic, apocaly apocalyptic waypoint in the future where two lovers could hope to meet when all had failed. And That's a little too predictive, but for, <laughs> exactly. for, for the time. Okay. <laughs> You're psychic. This is good to know. Um. <laughs> right? I think all designers are empaths. <laughs> but, the, uh, but the interesting thing is that, you know, so much of our, you know, we, we had the streetscape to work with where we had to move everything out constantly for farmer's market. And we really couldn't do some of the things that would create more permanent canopy or inclusion enclosure. And uh, so it was really grabbing the ethos of the brand and the deep heart space of our clients. And in the restaurant, there's this childlike nostalgia and playfulness and there are magical animals. And so we created life-size versions of that and move them outside and um, just try to create moves to, to carry their spirit into that space. That's really fun um, and super creative. You know, I like this idea of um, bringing the art, you know, that you would normally have inside, bringing that outside. Um, and I think that's kind of the perfect segue um, over to Sandra, um, who is an artist, as well as an architect, I believe, um, and her beautiful sculptures. Sandra, will you tell us a little bit more about those, especially your fire totems and fireballs? Sure. Well, I, I will start just by saying that uh, I've been working as an architect with my own practice for over 30 years. And m much of the focus of our work uh, has been with cultural centers, museums, and and university projects where the communal space is really very important. And that, um, that important space, the, the, the place where people gather has always inspired me. Um, and now working as an artist, in addition to my architectural work, um, that's been the focal point. And I've, um, I don't know if this is good timing. It's kind of an odd thing to say in a pandemic. Um, two things. One is that I, I had been Connecticut based, but now since July, I've been living and working in Southern California. And Smart move. Smart yeah, move. oh, absolutely. Um, but here's, here's what's happened for me. My interest in um, functional fine art, uh, mm -hmm. where I was repurposing uh, 
mooring buoys to become fire vessels or fireballs. And then I struck on the idea of elevating the uh, ubiquitous patio heater, which is everywhere now, of course, and in high demand, to be uh, yet again, a, something that was um, an art piece as well, that it could create something um, more than just delivering heat, but that was a story to be told and a way to connect people to something shared, to something that would uh, inform them uh, to the magic of being outdoors in a particular place. Architects are always talking about placemaking and the sense of place. And I've extended that uh, passion to the work that I'm doing as an artist to infuse everything that I do with, uh, with a narrative um, about nature or about a community or about a, a particular place. I, I think that sounds amazing. Um, and I've seen some of your work. It is magical and it does look like it tells the story of a place, um, which sort of brings up the question of, you know, narrative when we're talking about dining and outdoor dining, um, but indoor dining too. Um, and Larry, I feel like you've had some experience with this, particularly at the French Laundry uh, when you were there um, and how team there creates a narrative around the food, um, but, but that really connects to the experience. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how that works from your perspective? Yeah, sure. And, and you know, so much of it is also, um, you know, the, the guests coming into the French Laundry, for example, and the amount of time that they're there and the relationships that you can build with clients over a four hour dinner you know, as opposed to just serving food, getting a check, paying and leaving. So, you know, one of the things that we always emphasize with our staff was knowledge and of course, knowledge of the food. So that, you know, not only could I talk to you about the, you know, the ling cod that you were being served, but I could tell you, you know, where it was caught from, you know, the purveyor that we got it from, why we're using it, what it's sauteed in, you know, those sort of things. And all of a sudden, when you can start to use that as well as when you're talking about the, you know, the environment that you're in, the chairs that you're in, why we're using these types of napkins, these types of linen that we have on the tablecloths, why there's no artwork on the walls, you know, why there's no distraction of, of you know, my staff not wearing any jewelry or not being allowed to wear cologne or perfume, you know, so it's just that whole idea of keeping everything kind of some sense of continuity and that involves or it brings the client into that as well, you know? And so they're sitting there and, you know, maybe they just came in for dinner, but, you know, they're, they're leaving there or they become a part of this whole thing. And it's not to, it's not to hammer them over the head with information. That's, that's not it, you know, but it's to get them to appreciate what we're doing and why we're doing it. And there are a lot of people that are very interested in that. And those are the people that you can then discuss it even more and more and more. And it really becomes, uh, you know, kind of a beautiful thing. And, you know, the guests who just want to have dinner and drink their wine and be left alone and celebrate their anniversary. I mean, absolutely. You, you do that as well. And the space, the outdoor space, um, you know, these days, if we're thinking about outdoor dining, um, this space can be created to accommodate that, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, you even have almost more opportunity to do that, obviously, depending on where you are. You know, if you're on uh, 57th and 3rd in Manhattan, it's a very different than you are if you're in Malibu. Um, but both of those, you know, have unique opportunities to be the yurts that I've seen in various places being used outside of restaurants in Boulder, Colorado, for example, I think are just a, a wonderful idea and a wonderful adaption to doing something beautiful in an environment that can be extreme, you know, and then also getting the guests to appreciate it, understand why you're doing this um, and getting them involved, I think is always a wonderful thing. So. What are some of those other kind of all weather um, it trends that the rest of you are seeing with uh, for outdoor dining that you think might remain with us moving forward. 
Who's going to yeah. answer that? I will. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'll just uh, comment that we've seen this extraordinary shift from the orange cones demarcating uh, an, an area in a, what was a parking lot to boxwood containers to now what Larry is just saying, where, you know, yurts. I mean, I find this to be the most uh, extraordinary moment for uh, this creative group to, um, to be inventive and to be forward thinking about the outdoor space. Uh, and as I listen to all of you, I'm thinking, you know, it's, it's it's an opportunity for us to collaborate on delivering the story or the the what's unique the unique experience of whether it's Larry's Stone Edge Farm restaurant you know what what is it that we can do collectively that really celebrates this this opportunity to be not only outdoors but connected to one another uh, through art through through um, uh, architectural elements through the furnishings and all the things which go together to create that memorable experience. Mm -hmm. What about uh, what about outdoor gardens? Have they been playing a role? I mean, we we've also talked about fire, fire being part of the um, part of the new experience outside. Um, and, but what about outdoor gardens? Have you seen an increase in those in the hospitality space? Yes. Uh, you, wanna, you wanna take for us, It's like every hotel that we've been doing that has a rooftop or it has an outdoor plaza or a, let's say a, 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 a multifunctional space where you can turn it into a function or you could turn it into a bar space. You could turn it into an entertainment space. A lot of them are using actual herbal gardens as as boundaries and designing the landscaping so that you the uh, chefs can take advantage of the box the small boxes and plant whatever they want to that they're featuring and then the guests um, depending on how it's set up can go and check uh, you know actually look at those herbs or say I'd like this in my salad and. I think it's very popular. I think it gives, I mean, when you know your food is fresh and you're outdoors and you just see it right there and you see the chefs coming out and harvesting some of this, it's, it's really a magical experience. And I think what we all want to take away from any place that we're staying outdoors is obviously the environment where we are, the company that we're with the food that we're with, the ambiance, the lighting, and, and whatever the artful situation is. It's like one hand. I, I can design great spaces, but if I don't have all the other elements, the food, the lighting, the art, the, 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 the artistry in the, in, the, in the food making, it doesn't do me any good to have the hand without the other fingers. So it, it really is, takes a team effort. And the outdoor gardens are just phenomenal. I'd like to see more of them. I, I'd love to chime in on that too. I agree yes. with K100%. And we did a little Nikkei restaurant, a Japanese Peruvian, really talented team, uh, sort of on the dime uh, last year. And one of the things that we did was they, it was really important. The concept was to create an edible garden mm -hmm. that the kitchen and the bar are constantly running to. And in the main dining space, we created a grid where the guys are hanging up their trimmings and then they're coming over and reaching over the table and trimming what they need for whatever cocktail during service. That's, That's sort of fun interaction. Yeah. I, I love that. And I also love that you're talking about it with regard to the bar too. It's not just the chefs, it's also the bartenders, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, something else I've seen which has been really wonderful is you know, past year is uh, the collaboration. You know, we've had uh, quite a few higher end restaurants, uh, San Francisco, but also here in the North County, you know, that don't necessarily have the outdoor space, you know, to do a, a dinner or a lunch. So they collaborate with a winery, you know, that has a beautiful setting, 
um, you know, just kind of natural. And most wineries have built-in kitchens. And, and so the chef from a restaurant will then come to the winery and you're pouring the winery's wines to, you know, go along with the lunches and or dinners. And, you know, and so it's kind of a win-win situation for, uh, for both the food, the chefs, the winery, the winemakers, and they both get to showcase their wares at the same time. And of course, the, the guests are the ones who, you know, really get to appreciate it all. Now, um, you know, we've talked a little bit about the, the kind of union of the narrative between the food and the design, um, but if we're thinking more, you know, focus more on the design aspect, what are some of the wow factors, um, the elements that you can include that kind of speak to the narrative, but add a little extra design wow outside? Well, I think there's a lot of uh, things you can do. I mean, if, if you've noticed there's a big trend to have these movable walls, which actually mm -hmm. can be treated in so many ways. I mean, they can be an art statement. They can be just a natural wall. They can be planted herbs. They can be, they can be so many things, but they're also divisions of space. And again, they give the comfort level for people sitting there. So, you know, it's kind of like when you're at a restaurant, people walking behind your back, it can kind of get annoying. And it allows the restaurant to be very mobile. You can set up, um, things outside and people can create different environments and then there's so many things you you know with integrated led lighting i mean we we're seeing outdoor theaters we're seeing a, a lot of fun stuff that's going outdoors and you know kind of brings me back to my childhood <laughs> that outdoor theaters i love it i'd like to add to what kay is saying and um because i i hear things like that or it just kind of occurs to me um, and it informs what I'm going to do next. So the, the flexible, movable walls, for example. Mm -hmm. um, I agree with you that that sense of comfort where you have your back against something rather than sitting out in the open field. I mean, it's just kind of a natural. So I've been designing these um, standing screens, mm -hmm. which again have you know this um, artful aspect to it. It's not a, a random pattern or an abstract thing, but that is another opportunity to create a comfortable um, niche, if you will. Um, it's, it's like being in a banquette. Mm -hmm. And it also defines that space. And um, because they're movable, it's not, it's not a fixed architectural element. It just offers that, uh, that flexibility back to the, the restaurant or the venue. But to me, this is just like a, a really fun thing to play with that is um, a way to define an outdoor environment and to create that, that uh, a more intimate space for, for seating. The other thing is, I mean, talking about fire, well, I guess I got started in this enterprise of mine uh, just thinking, well, these fire pits everywhere, and they're just fire pits. Uh, even even though the term is sort of a uh, a bit of a turnoff, and there's just so much more that we can come up with that is more engaging and interesting and beautiful. So um, that's how I have been thinking about outdoor space. Is that what else is it the the pavilions that you're talking about where there are shade structures which offer a more uh, artistic and um, and whimsical way of dealing with a functional uh, requirement. Mm -hmm. You know, I agree with Sandra so much on the creating the intimacies uh, and the, also the social dynamics. So creating visual fields where people are interacting is really important once you get your introverts comfortable. <laughs> but one of the challenges for us has been really to translate into the lighting design. Um, we're like, we're doing really specific things in lighting. Like one of our, our restaurants that uses a lot of forage and greens. We, um, you know, traditionally in interior space, you want this 2,700 Kelvin sort of warm incandescent lighting. It makes everyone beautiful and young and cozy. And yet 
if you put that on a salad, it turns it to mud. It kills all the greens. And so if you think, we think about lighting like watercolors, you know, you're painting blue and you're painting orange onto values. And so we, recently we, um, we did an experiment. We manufactured the first architectural black light lighting and used a very white jeweler's light on our chef's palette, but brought it way down so it's not on top of anyone's head or frustrating in any way. And then we partnered it with a black light that would then sort of start to have the colors pop more and also create a bit of a lavender shadow as you're going Ooh. through the design, dining experience. Really you're trying cool. to, <laughs> it's translating that into the exterior that you know we're, we're working with right now too. And I do think that lighting is really important outside. People, you know, are most, when they're doing, going to fine dining, it tends to be at night. Um, you want to be able to see what the chefs have actually prepared for you. Um, and it's nice to see each other, sort of, sometimes, but, um, you know, you also want to read the menu, you know, the practical. <laughs> I mean, how many times have you seen a person holding a candle, a tiny little candle, like a little tiny flame up to the menu because they can't see anything? Um, so I, I do think lighting's important um, for both drama in the space, but also for, um, you know, practical comfort. Um, and, and that sort of brings me to our next question. Um, you know, comfort when dining outdoors is a, is a big deal. Um, you know, you get, people get chilly, they don't wanna linger. Um, so it's an essential part of the ambiance. What do you look for in outdoor materials, um, such as those featured um, in our Janus showrooms, um, that, well, behind you guys, not me tonight. Um, it, what are some of those, you know, things that you're looking for, whether it's textiles or other materials? Well, um, I think the majority of people are, again, for comfort and um, seating that, you know, you've seen so much of this outdoor seating that's just flat and hard and looks like a flat architectural rock. And I mean, yes, that's a look and it's good, but again, you can't really enjoy a lot of time there. So we're adding a lot of back pillows, you know, kidney pillows, extra layers of pillows, um, almost on everything we do. Uh, we always order the extra. Even when it's the architectural look, we'll do some really streamlined, you know, look, strapping the pillows or something to make it look very custom. And then, you know, we're adding that extra layer of wrap on the foam that gives it almost like a down look. Uh, which actually makes it feel more residential outside. That's some of the biggest trends I see. And then in the materiality that's coming outside, all these wonderful, you know, artistic kind of uh, bronzes and uh, shaped metals, which are very interesting that are happening in uh, outdoor furniture. And it's not just something aluminum, you know, with four legs, right, with a top on it. So I think the we see a lot of organic uh, shapes happening, which, you know, it's about time that that happens. So I'm excited to see what's still going to keep happening. And I think Janice is on the forefront of that. She's always been way ahead of everybody else in developing, you know, innovative product. Well, I mean, in the and Sandra with yeah. her fire. Well, I have to say that, uh, you know, durability is a, is a big factor. Uh, mm -hmm. I do a lot of work in really coastal, cool. in coastal environments, including in Bermuda, where <laughs> there's, you, you can make one decision as far as a, a, uh, uh, fireball is concerned. It's, it's designed to rust. It was a buoy after all, but then there are other things that I've been working on, um, whether they're screens or lanterns or, or um, fire totems where uh, it, they have to be well crafted to withstand the elements. So it, whether it's powder coating or a certain grade of stainless steel, um, these are really important decisions in uh, both the manufacturing and the selection of things. So um, it, it, it goes on and on. It's a whole different set of requirements for outdoor environment, especially when you're investing 
as uh, restaurants are now for the near, it's, it's not just gonna be for the next 10 minutes or 10 days. This is, this is an investment that is going to be um, permanent. And so, uh, Larry, you could probably speak to that. I'm sure that uh, there was a lot of conversation about, you know, how far are we going to go with this? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, everybody's trying to break out their crystal ball to see, uh, to see what the time frame is. And, you know, that brings up a great point, which is, you know, obviously here in California, we've been, you know, trying to keep people warm for the last three months. Well, you know, in two months from now, we're going to, be trying to keep people cool. <laughs> um, and yep. fortunately, you know, the April and May and June are typically just lovely, especially in the early evening um, sort of thing. But, you know, when we start hitting the midsummer months and, and later summer, um, that's going to be a concern, you know, and, and how do I, uh, you know, how do I keep my guests cool? You know, I mean, fans are obviously a great idea, right? But you know, fans are almost like the heaters that we were talking about. Some of them are not attractive. And, and uh, you know, I'm cold. I have this fan on me and you're warm because the fan's not hitting you. Um, and, you know, and, you know, I know we had roughly talked about umbrellas and, you know, I'm trying to keep the sun off of your face and, you know, or off of your shoulders. And same time, you'd like to have something really attractive there as well that fits in with the environment and looks natural and adds beauty and you know is comforting to everybody uh, and so you know there's this whole other challenge coming up yeah. over the next few months as well and you know I mean I've had people tell me that I need to put misters you know and, and I, I don't want to feel like we're sitting in a produce section you know where, <laughs> You know, and the chef is certainly not going to let me do that, but but it's almost like you wish you could do that sort of thing. So maybe dry ice. Oh, <laughs> <thanks for laughs> that work. Let, us, let us know when you figure this out because this yeah. is an important. <laughs> yeah, if you can't have air conditioning running in a you know an open structure um, if, if you want any kind of energy efficiency. Uh, so, right. I mean, these are important things. It, and Sandra, you know, to your point, to the metals, um, you know, that's it's pretty fascinating. Now, I think there, you know, you can use um, marine grade stainless steel, right? Um, and there, well, there's and 316 there's, stainless, and there's marine grade mm -hmm. paint. Uh, Got it. Yeah, I mean, there there are a range of things to to use, but you just have to be aware of that. So right now we have choices at least, but a lot of this is very new, um, as Kay had mentioned earlier. And you know, hopefully, this is you know more of it will stick around and then be produced as a result of this really wild last year. Alexis, how how are you you know incorporating comfort into the outdoor spaces that you're creating? Oh gosh. Um. Uh, you mean pestering the city and the health department? <laughs> okay, <laughs> music and <laughs> candles. <laughs> right. right. I mean, so, wait, are you not allowed to use candles in many of the spaces? The right. health department wouldn't even allow it on the table because yeah. someone might touch it. No flowers, no, I mean, very restrictive. No flowers? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's I amazing. thought that was standard for restaurants, <laughs> flowers on the table. Right, right. You know, I, you know that we all have our, our methods, you know, you want to get the best chair possible and, and create mm -hmm. your, your zoning and your groupings and how the space works and how people interact. Um, but what, this might be a little off topic, but what, what I find really interesting are the typology shifts that are emerging out of all of this. So just even from the way that we, we use space, even the, the way we shop, the sort of chef curated dinners we're getting at home. And, and then some of the other hybrid models about, you know, I don't know what's going on with Apple's big development in downtown LA, but there's gonna be a food and beverage component in there. And, you know, and so really looking at the way we're interacting with immersion and dining and how that's shifting. I'm, Delighted to say I've been um, 
getting a lot of conversations floating around around hot springs recently, which is sort of my dream project. Mm -hmm. And I, I, what I see is that there's a conversation emerging that's about deep wellness. And it's something that I think that the beauty world had a hold of for a long time. It's more beauty and spa. And I really see that moving into the conversation of hospitality. And so food and beverage moving into hot spring and, and that kind of um, hybridization and, and also with connection to the source and, and regeneration and connection with our farmers. And so for me, that's the most exciting thing because it's a conversation of wellness that's about what it is to be human. You know, it might be staying up all night or eating too much. <laughs> But that, that's the comfort that I think. Is and, you know, and I, I think that's, that's really interesting. And I think you are onto something that that is pretty much the cusp of this trend. And, you know, a lot of what we're talking about when we, when we think about comfort in the outdoor space or in dining, um, it's, it's psychological comfort. As Kay was mentioning with, you know, having a structure over your head makes you feel a lot more secure and comfortable. Um, but also the warmth of fire, you know, these things do feed our soul. You know, we do, we go out to eat, you know, to feed the belly, um, but we also go out to eat to feed the soul. We, we go to hotels and resorts to experience something different, to be transported and, as you said, immersed in a new space. So I think that's a really interesting uh, thing to remark on. Um, okay, we are just about 15 minutes out from the end, and I wanted to introduce um, a few questions from our audience for each of you, if that's okay. Um, Kay, this, the first one is for you. What are the three hotel projects that have really been the highlight of your career and why? Oh, that's a difficult one. But, uh, I think the... Um, the most recent one that I completed, which was the JW in Anaheim, because mm -hmm. it's very, very modern space and it's got magnificent high ceilings. It's got the wonderful sculpture garden outside, mm -hmm. farm to table thing that we're talking about. It's got the indoor outdoor bar, which is really lovely. You, you get your curated cocktails and everything. Uh, I, I just think that one has a special place in my heart because um, we did it during a pandemic and um, they've been suffering so much. So I'm hoping that when Disney opens, they'll really get people to see this magnificent space. But the other one I think is also um, the Inn at the Mission. We did this little tiny boutique hotel uh, right at, in, at the Inn at the Mission in San Juan Capistrano. And that's, if, if anyone's been there, that's one of the, uh, I think it's the second mission uh, within a string of missions along California. And this hotel's right smack, uh, right at the corner there. So if you come into town, you can't miss it. And, and I think what's really great about it is it's got different architecture. It's got like the Spanish architecture and it's got this kind of um, early settler architecture. It's interesting and di different buildings. And then it's got all this outdoor space. And it's always so perfect during the pandemic because it's got this indoor, outdoor, you flow from meeting spaces. So it's got, it creates its own fire pits and water features and things like that. And it's a little traditional, whereas the JW is totally opposite, very contemporary. And then the one I would think that is really special on my heart because um, you know, our history is what we're going to become, right? When we, when we study history, we learn from it. And it's the um, World War II Hotel called the Higgins in New Orleans. And it's a very, it's right adjacent to the World War II Museum. And you know, there are very few vets around. They're in their 90s, 100s, and many of them are dying off. And our children don't know what it was like to be in, you know, what happened during World War II and how the different countries came together. And the museum tells it from a perspective. Uh, it doesn't tell, say like from the USA or, you know, it's, it's from a Japan's point of view. It's from uh, Russia's point of view, China's point of view, German's point of view. It's, it's very interesting how 
it teaches about culture, about differences, what happened. And so from that standpoint, doing that, that's the hotel's going to be around for a long time. And it's going to teach kids because they have schooling and things. So I'm kind of proud to be part of that. And there's only going to be one World War II museum hotel, you know. So uh, that's pretty cool. You seem that is very cool. It sounds amazing. Yeah. It, it really what a great is. Experience. The museum is amazing. Not the it, hotel's okay. Museum is amazing. You got to go. It, it sounds like it, and it, you know, and the JW project really also sounds pretty incredible. It's nice oh, to yeah. have that kind of respite right next to Disney. Um. Well, it's the first only five star there. You know, everything else has been kind of Mickey Mouse. You know. <laughs> No pun intended. Yes, no pun intended. Okay, Alexis, this next question is for you. Um, what is the most unique outdoor dining space you've created, and what elements do you think make it stand apart from other projects? <laughs> oh my gosh, there's projects flashing before my eyes like I'm dying. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm. I'm in development on a project right now that's uh, deeply meaningful and, and very important, which is um, sort of an architectural compound that is designed to hold the dying in their last days. It's called Aotearoa. Mm -hmm. And sort of almost like a bit, it's got, it has an Amangiri vibe a bit sort of earthy and Ooh. awesome and sublime architecture. And the F and B conversation in the programming and concepting is really, really beautiful. And so it's it's creating it such that, you know, there's an opportunity for jazz brunch. There's creating it so there's an opportunity to have private time with family cooking, you know, perhaps for someone coming off dialysis or this kind of thing. And then the opportunity to engage and create living funeral so that we sort of transform our conversation around death out of antiquated funerary processes and into something that's much more powerful and something of one's own choosing. So I don't know the specific design features of, of this yet because we're in development on it, but I just think the, the typology is really wonderful. That sounds pretty magical. Is that in Southern California? The first one, yes. Yeah. It's really fascinating. Um, I can't wait to hear more as this develops. <laughs> right. Uh, <Cool. laughs> and Larry, um, you know, from your perspective, what's the best time to, vi to visit Stone Edge Farm and the restaurant Edge, right? Um, and if you had to pick one thing from the menu to eat, what would it be and why? Mm. Maybe pair a wine with it. Yeah. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for putting me on after a building dedicated to World War II and another building <laughs> dedicated for, you know, those of us. <laughs> you bring the joy, Larry. <laughs> those, are, those are both lovely stories. And I'm, I'm seriously, I'm proud to be part of just sitting here with the five of you. So it's great. Um, and so the uh, best time to come to Edge, is that what, was that the question? Sorry. Yes. Um, or the farm, or Stone Edge Farm itself. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, our, our, our Stone Edge Farm winery is actually a few different things. It, it, it is a farm, you know, with, with honeybees and, and produce and stone fruit trees and, you know, and a microgrid. It's, it's also a, a, you know, 160 acre parcel at 1800 feet, you know, at the Mayacamas Mountains, where you can see the ocean, you know, from the very top of it with 200 year old oak trees. Um, you know, and then there's Edge, this restaurant. So for me, it's kind of like uh, late winter, which would be, you know, like a month and a half from now. So say the middle of April, you know, where the, the buds haven't started to come out yet mm -hmm. on the vines. But organic vineyard properties, you know, tend to have all these wonderful flowers and vegetables that are planted between the rows of the vines, you know, and, you know, the idea is obviously those get plowed under at some point and that all 
acts as kind of regenerative process to feed the grapes. But before the grapes start budding, you have all these just gorgeous flowers. You have all these wonderful birds and insects that are, you know, that just are everywhere. And also just the fact that, you know, we're in Northern California, so we've, you know, had whatever amount of rain we've had so that everything is green around you. And then all these spring vegetables are coming in, all these sugar snap peas and fava beans and, you know, and so that's, you know, that's just my favorite time in the air is nice and clean and, you know, it's just beautiful. And coming to Edge, uh, I mean, we're very fortunate that we have our head chef Fiorella Boutron is from Lima, Peru. Mm -hmm. And she's been with us for quite a while now, but, uh, and I've obviously been working with very talented chefs, Thomas Keller among them, but, you know, uh, the way Fiorella treats fish is, I tell you, it's, it's just beautiful. You know, so her aspect of serving a fish dish, it's really not even cooked. Uh, and it's not a ceviche, you know, it's a cured fish, but it's just so lightly cured using citrus and a lot of different chilies, which is what her background is. So the flavor of the fish is just, it's just vibrant. It just pops in your mouth. And then, you know, of course, we're serving that alongside our Sauvignon Blanc, which has a, enough semillon in there that gives it a little bit of kind of a lemon oil, but a, a good acid and a citrus quality to it as well. And, you know, you're sitting there on, you've got this warm heater next to you and hopefully you're with people that you love and, you know, it's, it's just wonderful, so. You're creating the story, I can feel it. <laughs> and now I'm, I'm starving. <laughs> <laughs> and I want a glass of wine. Uh, <laughs> Sandra, now this last question is for you. Um, can you share more about the fire totem in particular um, and how you customize each piece? And um, if you can tell us about any of your latest designs, that would be amazing also. Well, I'll tell you, I'm so inspired by what Larry just said. And first of all, I'm making a reservation right now. <laughs> <laughs> for end of April, right? The best time of the year, right? <laughs> so, so the fire totem is a, uh, think the think of the standard patio heater with a with like a sleeve that goes all around it. So it is a uh, a new environment around the functional piece. And what that means to me is that it's just a canvas that is um, my drawings cut out in sh you know, the sheet metal of whether it's three sided or four sided, where the the functional components are, are just intact. It just, it's like an iPhone cover. So just listening to Larry's description, I might be sketching away, I was doodling actually, Larry, I have to say, about the things which are part of the vineyard, uh, the organic vineyard experience that people might not really even think about. These flowers, I know it, I know it, you're, I have images of this because I've been, uh, visiting you at that time of year, where the, the flowers and the, 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 the birds, the bees, the, all, the, all the little things that are part of the story that you were just telling. So I might sketch something that really speaks to that, which as part of the, uh, the dining experience, you could say, you know, this is what's happening here. And you may only think of of the grapes and the vineyards themselves, but this is part of the natural process. And so it, when you're asking me, what, what am I working on? Well, I'm inspired by those sort of stories. I've done uh, pieces which uh, take the Ocotillo plant, for example, here in the, the, uh, the desert of Southern California, which looks like a very strange plant, if I think most of the people listening to this would know, it, it, it only starts to develop any sort of green, it looks dead for quite a while. I'm noticing now that it has these green leaves and it, otherwise it's very spiky and forbidding. And it, I thought it was marvelous that this is a habitat that hummingbirds love. And mm -hmm. there are just so many hummingbirds where I am here, it's, it's pretty marvelous, but that was the first fire totem that I designed um, just uh, out of uh, curiosity really about um, desert plants. I've designed um, uh, recently a fire totem that uh, com completely different sort of thing. It was a story um, 
It was actually a gift to my dad <laughs> for his uh, 94th birthday. And the, the imagery there was taken from a visit to his um, childhood home. It was an apartment building in the Bronx <laughs> where inside the lobby, there were these beautiful tiles that sort of looked William Morris-like, these mm -hmm. beautiful peacocks and birds and flowers and so on. And I um, adapted that, those images to become these uh, image panels for the fire totem. What a and, special gift, that's incredible. Oh yeah, yeah, it was. And, and so I, it's, it's, any, it's anything and everything that is the inspiration for this new canvas that I found um, that is either about a place or about a memory or about some sort of cultural aspect. I love it. It sounds so beautiful. And I can't wait to see what you're going to do with your sketches um, from Larry's description. Oh, I will. Yeah. <laughs> um, does anybody have anything else they want to add um, before we wrap up? I'll add one more thing. And, and then I, I hope other people say something. I, I just love the idea that we're all gathering together and putting our collective creative minds towards this new opportunity of outdoor living and outdoor dining. I think it'll make uh, for the most memorable places for people to come and gather. I think it'll transform the future, that's for sure. Yeah. Anyone else? No? Okay, well, thank you all for participating. It's been an honor and a pleasure to be here with you and um, I hope we all go out and enjoy an outdoor dining experience tonight. <laughs> Thank you, Janice. Thanks, Thanks you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody.